Dubai is often viewed as one of the bougiest areas in the world. From the Burj Khalifa and the Burj Al Arab to the Atlantis and the dozens of lavish malls, it seems like Dubai is one of the best places in the world to live. Combine this with a no income tax and it's not surprising why so many rich individuals decide to retire in Dubai. With that being said though, Dubai often hogs the global spotlight when it comes to the UAE and the people often overlook the emirate right next to it, Abu Dhabi. While Abu Dhabi isn't talked about nearly as often, they're just as well off if not more well off. And one of their biggest flexes is their extremely wealthy sovereign wealth fund. Abu Dhabi's wealth fund currently manages $697 billion. This isn't quite the biggest in the world as there's three countries with even larger funds. However, the thing to note is that the countries with larger funds have significantly larger populations as well. The most recent population numbers from Abu Dhabi indicate that there's 1.54 million residents in the city. If we divide $697 billion by 1.54 million people, we get a whopping $452,597 per person. But it gets even better than that. You see, uh, while all residents of the Emirate directly or indirectly benefit from the Sovereign Wealth Fund, the fund is primarily meant for Abu Dhabi citizens. And as we know, uh, most of the people in the UAE aren't actually citizens. It's estimated that only 11.48% of the UAE's population are nationals of the country, while 88.52% are expats. This number is likely skewed by Dubai, but even if we assume that 20% of Abu Dhabi's residents are nationals, we only get 308,000 people. And if we divide $697 billion by 308,000 people, we get a cool $2.262 million per citizen. To put that in perspective, if we divide Social Security's $2.852 trillion in assets by the 291 million citizens in the country, we get, um, $9,774 per citizen. But before you try to move to Abu Dhabi, unless you're from a neighboring country, you won't be able to wriggle yourself in anytime soon. The UAE has extremely strict citizenship policies, and you'll need to live in the UAE for at least 30 years to even apply. So, while you and I probably can't benefit from this, it's insane to see how well off Abu Dhabi citizens really are. Just a hundred years ago though, Abu Dhabi was a no-name country that was filled with nomads who were just trying to fight for daily survival. So, here's how the average Abu Dhabi national went from being nomads to being multimillionaires within just a few generations. Taking a look back, the story of Abu Dhabi only dates back to 1761. Before 1761, there's no records of human civilization in the town specifically, which makes sense given that the area was just a desert which is extremely difficult to inhabit without the help of modern technology. Nonetheless, a few tribesmen from the Al Bufala clan decided to set up a small town in Abu Dhabi in 1761. Originally, the area was called Mil, which means salt in Arabic. One of the driving factors of the early Abu Dhabi economy was pearl diving. The tribesmen would trade these pearls with the Iranians and the Indians. This provided them with enough capital to sustain a small civilization, but Abu Dhabi's population never exceeded a few thousand people. In fact, even at the start of 1900, Abu Dhabi only had a total of 6,000 residents. Despite the small population, Abu Dhabi would soon struggle to even support these residents. You see, throughout the early 1900s, Japan's pearling industry would take off, which led to Abu Dhabi losing most of their customers. To make things worse, the Great Depression would hit in 1929, which wiped out the few remaining customers Abu Dhabi had. In desperation, residents diverted their focus onto camel herding and the production of dates and vegetables, but things were quite rough. Most residents lived in huts built from palm leaves, while wealthier residents lived in mud brick homes. But soon enough, the country would get a glimpse of hope. On March 3, 1938, Saudi Arabia would not only discover oil, but one of the largest oil reserves in the world. Abu Dhabi's ruler at the time, Sheikh Shakbat, would instantly authorize foreign companies to come in and start looking for oil in 1939. But this turned out to be an extremely long process. You see, World War II would really pick up steam in the first half of the 1940s, which put oil exploration on hold. Even after World War II though, the search for oil was rather difficult due to the large sand dunes and sandstorms all across Abu Dhabi. Also, the oil companies were likely not that motivated to find oil in Abu Dhabi. After all, Abu Dhabi was a rather small area and they had already found an ocean of oil in Saudi Arabia. 
so they had little need to find oil in Abu Dhabi as well. Nonetheless, they kept looking and the first sign of discovery would come in 1951. Light traces of oil and gas would be discovered at the Murban No. 1 well at a depth of 10,000 feet. Engineers would enthusiastically continue drilling deeper, but at 12,500 feet, they would make an unpleasant discovery, sour gas. Sour gas is a natural gas that's extremely poisonous and flammable. One petroleum engineer would unfortunately be killed when sour gas burst out from the pipes. For obvious reasons, drilling at the site was halted, but the search for oil was not. And eventually, in 1958, Abu Dhabi would finally discover oil at the Amshai field nearly 20 years after the search had begun. While Abu Dhabi had struck oil, oil money didn't change the emirate all that much. You see, Sheikh Shakbat was extremely cautious of spending the oil money because he didn't know how long it would last. It took 19 years to find a viable oil field, and if this field ran dry, it could take another 19 years or even more to find another. So uh, while Sheikh Shakbat spent some of the money on concrete buildings and paved roads, he saved the vast majority of it. But as years passed and Abu Dhabi was able to negotiate better profit sharing agreements, much of the government and the people felt that Sheikh Shakbat could be less frugal. These tensions would eventually blow over in 1966 when Sheikh Shakbat was basically forced to retire and replaced by his brother, Syed. Unlike Sheikh Shakbat, Sheikh Zayed was extremely optimistic and felt that oil money could revolutionize Abu Dhabi forever. But he decided to start simple and establish the basic necessities of a city. He went ahead and started building a road network that connected the center of the city with the various villages around the city. He also built a seawall on the north side of the city which protected the city from future damage from the ocean. He followed up these constructions with electricity, running water, and a central sewage system. Once the necessities were covered, he shifted his focus onto building modern government buildings, hotels, and housing projects. Around the same time, Britain would also leave the Persian Gulf which allowed for the UAE to gain political independence. Soon after, Abu Dhabi would be made the provisional capital of the UAE which made Sheikh Zayed the president of the entire country. Within just 10 years, Abu Dhabi went from being a city of nomads to gaining independence and rapidly industrializing. But Sheikh Zayed was careful not to let this progress get to his head. Sheikh Zayed was well aware that the oil money could stop at any point and that eventually the world would move towards more sustainable forms of energy. So he started investing excess oil revenue as soon as possible. Initially, in 1967, he created the Financial Investments Board which was responsible for investing the excess oil revenue. This was quite an ambitious move for the time. You see, back then and even now, countries mainly invest their money into gold and bonds. So, to create an investing body that would make investments outside these categories was quite unique. This investing body didn't last long though. Sheikh Zayed soon realized that for such a system to truly be effective, it had to be distanced from the government as much as possible. So, in 1976, Sheikh Zayed founded a new organization called the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority or the ADIA. As you would guess, he transferred the responsibility of investing excess oil revenue over to them, and this marks the beginning of Abu Dhabi's Sovereign Wealth Fund. Ever since the fund was founded, they have slowly invested into basically everything you can think of. This includes equities, fixed income, treasuries, real estate, private equity, and hedge funds. Abu Dhabi doesn't release a full report of all of their holdings like Norway, but they do release a breakdown of the categories in which they're invested. Taking a look at the breakdown, we can see that their biggest investment is in developed equities where they hold between 32 and 42% of their money. They also hold a decent amount in emerging market equities and government bonds. The smallest category, however, is small cap equities where they only invest 1-5% to of their money. As you can see, the ADIA's holdings are pretty well diversified and they avoid risky investments as much as possible, but things don't always go their way. Over the decades, they've made a handful of painful mistakes that have cost them hundreds of millions and sometimes even billions. One of these mistakes was getting involved in the Bank of Credit and Commerce International or the BCCI. In the 1980s, the BCCI was the seventh largest private bank in the world with over $20 billion in assets, so it likely seemed like a pretty safe place to invest some money. But the BCCI would eventually be linked with a massive money laundering scheme and loads of other financial crimes, which led to the bank closing in 1991 and the ADIA losing hundreds of millions. 
Similarly, another major mistake the ADIA made was investing heavily in 2007 and 8. The ADIA was literally buying the top of the housing bubble, and one of their biggest investments was $7.5 billion into Citigroup. Once the housing bubble popped though, Citigroup stock crashed 90% and it never recovered. The ADIA suffered several similar losses during this time period, but despite the downfall, the ADIA continued to consistently invest and it's worked out pretty well for them overall. The last time the ADIA revealed annual returns was in 2010, and at the time, it boasted an average annual return of 8.1% over the past 30 years. So they basically just match market returns, but it should be noted that the ADIA is likely far more diversified than the S&P 500. At the end of the day, having hundreds of billions in the bank is great and all, but the goal is to eventually cash in at a sustainable pace. Abu Dhabi has avoided cashing in as much as possible because they have much bigger ambitions for this fund. They don't want the fund to just give their citizens a solid retirement, but eventually make up for all revenue as the world transitions to sustainable energy. This is why one of the top goals of the fund is to move all of their assets to sustainable investments. We don't know exactly how much the ADIA has in sustainable investments, but some sources suggest that the figure is around two-thirds. So Abu Dhabi still has some work to do, but it looks like they're headed in the right direction. With that being said though, it doesn't look like withdrawals will become a thing anytime soon. It seems like Abu Dhabi really wants to get the fund to trillions of dollars first, just like Norway. So in the meantime, Abu Dhabi citizens are only multimillionaires on paper. But hey, it's still way better than social security. Do you guys think more countries should embrace a sovereign wealth fund? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you wish you had a part of Abu Dhabi's pie. And of course, consider checking out our international channels to watch our videos in other languages, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.